map of over 70 islands a few miles north of the Scottish coast at John O'Groats. Orkney is a landscape of wild, unspoilt beauty, varying from gently undulating countryside to cliffs that rise perpendicular to the sea. The old man of Hoy was once part of those cliffs, now eroded by the waves into dramatic isolation. Virtually everywhere you go on Orkney, there are reminders of earlier civilizations. The huge collective burial mound at Mays Howe and the standing stones of Stennis reflect a history of habitation going back at least 5,000 years. But in that long history, there is one event that stands out from all others, and it happened here at Scapa Flow. On Midsummer's Day in 1919, the entire German high seas fleet, which had been interned here since the end of the war, was scuttled on the orders of the German admiral so that his ships could not live again to fight in someone else's navy. In the Second World War, the British battleship HMS Royal Oak was torpedoed here in Scapa Flow by a German U-boat, which had slipped past the inadequate defences. More than 800 men drowned. On the orders of Winston Churchill, and as a direct result of that tragic loss, the very route taken by the German submarine was blocked off by an impressive causeway linking several of the islands together for the first time. The Churchill Barriers, as they came to be called, were built by Italian prisoners of war, and on a low hill overlooking the water, in two old army Nissen huts, there's a tangible reminder of the years they spent incarcerated on Orkney. The men who built those Churchill Barriers, the Italian prisoners of war, missed one thing as much as they missed Italy itself, and that was somewhere to worship. They had nowhere to celebrate Mass. So one day in 1943, a rather liberal and enlightened British commander said to them, if I give you the tools, will you build your own chapel? Well, the Italians readily agreed, and this was the result. Among the prisoners was an artist, Domenico Ciocetti. Copying a holy picture in his wallet, he painted a mural of the Madonna and Child. The tabernacle was made from wood recovered from shipwrecks. The lanterns that lit the altar were fashioned from the prisoner's bully beef tins. Giocetti was so proud of his chapel that after the war he was invited to return to Orkney to lead its restoration. Well, coming in to Stromness this morning is the p ferry from the Scottish coast, bringing with it dozens of people from Caithness who we've invited to be our guests today to swell the ranks of the Orcadians, the people of Orkney who number some 20,000 and many of whom we hope are coming to the Stromness Academy, the local school, to meet our familiar team of antiques roadshow experts. Do you know anything about them at all? Mm, not a lot. Uh, I, I think that they may have come out to a church or a chapel or something. Um, and how did you get them? I just bought them here in Orkney. Was it a long time ago? Ah, it would be you know, for 30 or maybe over 30 or 40 years. Did you pay a lot for them? There was plenty, I suppose, maybe in the teens of pounds, I would think. Well, they come all the way from Italy. Yes. And they were made in a small place called Castelli d'Abruzzo. I see. In the mm -hmm. 18th century. Mm -hmm. And at Castelli, they specialise in making these large tiles or plaques mm -hmm. painted with all sorts of subjects. And this one here... I think it's Saul. It is, that's it right. Is it's the conversion of St Paul, there, whose name was Saul, Saul. until he yes. became St Paul. Yes. And there's God speaking to him out of the clouds, saying, mm -hmm. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Yes. In Latin. And there he is falling over backwards, and his lovely horse, all that. And, and this one... Well, this must, must be baby Jesus. Yes, and, this is the Holy Family. Yes. Or the, what you call them in art... Marian. Art terms, sure. the adoration of the Magi. Here mm -hmm. are the, the three kings turning up, mm -hmm. and as you can see, they've parked their camels behind. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the factory was dominated by two great families of painters. One of the families was called Grue, G R U E, and the other was called Gentile. I think that these ones date from about 1740 I and see. were probably painted by a man called Aurelio Grue. I see. Uh -huh. And you could see this particularly by the amount of, of manganese or purple he used, mm -hmm. and that's very mm -hmm. typical of Aurelio Grua. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one may be a little later, because he's got rather more green in it, 
What's interesting is that as far as I can see, that's the original frame. That's an 18th century frame, which is a very good feature. Admittedly, somebody's stuck it together, but that's not a problem. And you, this one presumably has a frame. Uh, I had a frame, it's lost. Oh, what a pity. But without a frame, I would think that this one is worth between two and three thousand pounds. And this one, which is bigger and mm -hmm. a, a, a very active subject, mm -hmm. between four and five thousand pounds. Thank you very much. But they really are very exciting and amazing things to come all the way to Orkney to, yes. to see. Yes, and thank you very much. <laughs> now, this is a piece of furniture that you really can't ignore because the crane and figure on the top of this table is really spectacular, isn't it? It is lovely, yeah. Now, do you have this table tilted upwards and in a corner so that you see the grain, or do you have it flat no, like this? No, it's in use every day. <laughs> it's in use every day. That's wonderful. Do you keep a cloth? over it. No. No? Because the colour has also remained and that's what part of the beauty mm -hmm. so that you get this wonderful strong honey colour with the black marks running right the way through it and it yeah. really is wild in this rosewood yeah. top to it. When I first saw the, the, the table there was the quality that sprang out. Not only has it got this tremendous grain on the top but if we can go down underneath yes. and look at the pedestal. Now this also, I think, is really something to enjoy. I and mean, I'm not sure you don't always get down on your knees like this and look at it. But occasionally for dusting. <laughs> occasionally for dusting. Well, it looks in beautiful condition here. And the generosity of all the forms, all the shapes. If you just run your hands around yes. the pedestal here or over the legs and down to this extraordinary fleshy, leafy scrolls, which are quite prehensile, you feel they're going to come out at you. But all that is really a sign of quality, I think. You've got a really good table yeah. here. There are lots of these circular pedestal tables around. Uh, they are ubiquitous. In most rooms in 19th century houses, you would have a circular pedestal table. Yeah. But many of them are really of very little quality. This one, I think, is very, very fine indeed. I had a cover on it, but I have got a husband who likes folks to see the green. It's very difficult, isn't it, to preserve <laughs> it on one side and to enjoy it and see it on the other. If you keep it away uh, from direct sunlight, yes. then there's no real problem yeah. at all. I mean, are you interested in, in the in market the value. value at all? Well, Would you rather not know? <laughs> about, we've had it. It's been in the family. It's my husband's aunt who um, originally had it. But when we got it, um, it was valued at five pounds. Five pounds? Circular tables weren't popular. <laughs> no, that, and that's... that was about 40 years ago, I think. Right. We well, now it. you'll be looking more in the region of two, two and a half to three, three and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, so worth, worth looking at. Thank after. you very much. Well, it was a wedding present which we received from family friends who had travelled extensively in the East. Yes. He'd been in the, in, their husband had been in the Indian Army. It's amazing how much Oriental pottery and porcelain does actually get to all the seafaring nations up in Northwest Europe. And I was hoping that we'd get quite a bit of Japanese here today. So here's one splendid piece of satsuma ware. Um, the nice thing about it is really its shape. If it were just a straightforward, round, ovoid shape, it would not be, I have to say, a terribly exciting piece. But the strength of the potting in producing this octagonal shape is what gives it its tre tremendous presence. Let's just start with the shoulder, where you see typical designs for Japanese and, in fact, also Chinese pottery and porcelain. The first is the phoenix, and if you then twist it round here, you'll see the companion dragon. Yes. The dragon is the male, and the phoenix is the female. But then going to the main body of the piece, what you have is, in fact, a rather charming outdoor scene with women and children basically just out of doors enjoying themselves. And you always spot something new every time yes. you look at it. There's a tremendous amount of detail in it. You're absolutely right. When you think that even right down to the individual spots in the sky, I mean, those are done by hand. Everything is done by hand. And a vase like this typically would have taken maybe three weeks Good heavens. in total painting time. Then going into the, the base, there we see 
the Satsuma Mon. Incidentally, the Satsuma Prince was, in fact, Christian at an early stage, yes. uh, which is why his own personal medallion incorporates the crucifix, the cross. See, yes. And there you have the potter's mark, which I'm afraid is rather stylized. I can't read the first character. The second character says Zan. Uh, it could be Rio Zan. I'm not sure. But anyway, there's one more salient point about this which affects its value. Do you know what that might be? I haven't a clue. It's condition. Well, if we, it ha were we have looked after it. I've tried to. You've looked after it. Okay. Well, in that case, I have to ask you, how did this happen? Looking inside there. I don't know. We only noticed that yesterday when yes. we started cleaning it to take it here. Yes. Would that be a blow from the inside or the outside? Almost certainly a, an impact of some sort just there has created a little star crack. It's probably not visible in the outside, but it is certainly visible on the inside and it, it has a bearing on the value of the piece. It's, it's quite close to another crack, which we can't see, which is called a firing crack. Yes. And that doesn't have any effect on the value at all. Is it liable to get what? The star crack is, it can get worse, but the firing crack is unlikely to get worse. That is the reason for it not really mattering. Well, it's sat in the living room all our married life, and we try to look after it, but, you know, with a family growing up, it is bound to have had knocks. Yes. Well. It's imperfect, so it's only worth somewhere in the region of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Amazing. <laughs> what started all this off? This cup and saucer? And where do you got this from Granny? No, I got that at the auction. Oh, this at auction? Yeah. Both the little miniature cups yeah. and saucers? Now, did you actually bid for them yourself? Yeah. Shoved your hand up and bid? I, well, I didn't have any money, so I asked Mum how much she was going to pay, and then I... The much she, how much she said, then I just got it. Oh, well, that's very brave. Many, many adults are scared to go and bid at an auction. They think they're going to have something knocked out to them like a clock, and they didn't bid, only scratch their nose. But you boldly went where many people fear to tread. That's jolly nice, you know, that's very nice. That's made by Minton, and it's a little toy cup and saucer for putting in a, a small cabinet. Not really for use, not for a child to play with, but um, it's hand-painted, and I think that's very beautiful. How much did you pay for these? Well, I, I got that, and that's it. And then I got that, and then I got that. And the other cup and saucer, and the little that. glass hat. Something like 13 pounds, isn't it? 13, yeah. one, three, 13 pounds. Yeah, well, that, that is worth more than you gave for the lot. That's very, very beautiful. That's worth around about 30, 40 pounds. That's very, very nice. What's this? It's got a squeak in it. It's got the, 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 the paper and oh, salt. Oh, this is, if you, uh, this, this is <laughs> incredibly <laughs> rare because these are for, made Obviously, we use it for the blind. Because you, don't, you want to know what you're putting on your... You want to know how... Well, when does it work? I don't know. Look, it's for children. It's to encourage children, children to use pepper, you oh, see. Oh, is that what it is? That's what you do. You encourage children to use a lot of pepper. They're <laughs> wonderful. The and so did your grandfather, great-grandfather, buy it? Or, or no, it was given to him. Given to him. Because J.G. Millet is famous in two different ways. First of all, he's the son of the most famous pre-Raphaelite artist, Sir John Everett Millet. Mm. <clears throat> and he also wrote, and he wrote his father's biography. So people in the pre-Raphaelite world know him <clears throat> as a biographer. And uh, the, the second uh, thing that's so, that he's so famous for is uh, that he was a great uh, bird man and wildfowler and illustrated a lot of books. Uh -huh. and, and these are eider ducks. Uh -huh. And this is a bird you see commonly up here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, as for price, um, it doesn't make a great deal, but I would have thought somewhere around six to eight hundred pounds, between six and eight hundred. Those are the binoculars. Anything else in there for us? Yes, but just one oh, These right. look like sort of Second World War issue. Yeah. Are they Second World War issue? Well, yeah. they look right. fairly late to me. I would have thought right. they are 30s. From where, from where I can see, I think whoever did a, whoever did a sales job on binoculars in, uh, in Orkney, I, why is it everybody has a pair of binoculars in every because house. Because they're curious to see other They want people. to see what their neighbours are doing. They live so far apart. They're spying you, 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 Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. They, they I like see. the sheep that So it's not actually marbling. I, I've been told off by a person for calling it marbling. Yeah. And she said, you mustn't call it marbling. You must call it juggling. 
and I've really not thought much about it, I'm afraid. You know, a lot of the best and earliest pieces of porcelain have no mark on them. And therefore, you would they say... They haven't got any marks. No. That would, therefore, you would say, how the goodness do I know where it comes from? Yes, yes. Well, here we have a porcelain box. And when you look at it, it's got sort of Rococo scrolls in relief around the border here, and they yeah. go on, on each side. Yeah, yeah. So that's one hint about the date. It was yeah, made in the yeah. 1740s. Uh, this is made of a very hard white porcelain. So it's a German porcelain. Now, fortunately, there was only one factory really making boxes at that time, and that was the Meissen factory. Um, like all Meissen boxes of the period, it has two, two things happen inside. One, the interior of the body is gilt entirely, and two, the inside of the lid is beautifully painted. Now, these are actually stippled, and you have to imagine the artist painting there with a feather and a magnifying glass, putting on each little spot of colour one at a time. And the mount is the original mount. There's only one unfortunate thing that's happened with your mount, uh, and that is, if you look very carefully inside, you will see that there are traces of gilding. And this silver mount was originally a silver gilt mount. That's not, that's not a serious problem. What, of course, is a problem is what's happened here, oh, yes. where it has been broken. I didn't do it. You're not guilty, no. It, it, it happened before you... Yes. Got, I think that one could have this tidied up quite efficiently yeah. and not at great cost. Yeah. A box like this in perfect condition is worth five, six or seven thousand pounds. In this condition, well, it's lost a lot. But it's still, I, I think, worth well over a thousand pounds. And if we had it cleaned up nicely, I think it'd be well worth doing. But it is a very exciting and remarkable yeah. thing to see. Thank you very much. Your father would have got this from Stanley Cursiter. Yes, he definitely did, because in the firm they used to do a lot of framing of his pictures, and he got that one. In fact, uh, there was one or two more in the family, but that was the one that came my way. Because Stanley Cursiter was, the, was uh, it's really Orkney's most famous son as an artist. That's certainly. right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this must have been d done as a teenager. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Which would make it about 1907, 1905, 1907? Yes, about that time. It's slightly crudely painted, but it's a, a marvellously evocative view of Kirkwall. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it's full of all the life um, which the young Cursiter knew, and then he went down to uh, Scotland and uh, not only became a very famous uh, painter, mm -hmm. but also the Queen's limner for Scotland. That's right, The Queen's he was. painter for Scotland. Mm -hmm. And then he came back to Orkney and spent really the rest of his life here, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes, he retired here. Well, this picture, I, I, I think, is a, a slightly one-off, but of tremendous interest to people here, and, and yes. as such, I'd value it um, probably in the region of uh, 1,000, 1,500 pounds. Mm, yes, uh -huh. Well, now, we leave the people of Stromness and uh, our experts just for a moment for me to tell you about the Radio Times competition and, of course, to remind you that every week you stand a chance of winning a voucher which can then be exchanged for two and a half thousand pounds worth of antiques. So it really is well worth having a go. First, however, the answer to last week's question. We asked you to name the decorative technique used on this Pembroke table and the answer is parquetry. This is a technique in which pieces of wood are laid onto the carcass of the furniture in geometric designs. Well, now to this week's competition object, and here it is. This very pretty little bodkin case is a marvellous example of fine 18th century craftsmanship. It was made to carry a lady's bodkins uh, or needles, but is much more extravagant, really, than that simple task would suggest. The lid and the cylindrical body fit very snugly together. They're mounted in gold, and it's smothered all over in this most marvellous, colourful decoration of exotic birds sitting amid the branches of the trees. This lustrous bronze background colour is very reminiscent of oriental lacquer, and that gives you some clue as to the decorative technique used. The Europeans were great admirers of oriental skills in lacquering, and they made many attempts at imitating it. This was one of the most successful. And so, to the question, what is this decorative technique called? 
Now, to help you, it's probably a good idea to look at a copy of the new Radio Times, which gives you not only more details of the competition, but even goes so far as to suggest a few possible answers. And then your entry, please, needs to be postmarked before next Saturday and addressed to the Radio Times rather than to the Antiques Roadshow. I'll be setting another question next week and also, of course, providing the answer to this week's competition. In the meantime, now, back to the people of Orkney and our experts. Well, obviously, this is a piece of Weems pottery from, uh, uh, from Scotland. Well, of course, it's mm -hmm. a super piece, this one. You, you like it, do you? Yes, I do. I, I love these cockerels. I think they're absolutely marvellous. They strut around in the, in the grass there, and these gorgeous green colours, I think, which are very, very romantic. Now, of course, got very popular, but it was very popular around about 1900 to, to the 1920s, when it was bought, of course, um, by a very famous London people, including, uh, I suppose, the greater collector of the lot, the Queen Mother, um, who has a very fine collection. And uh, interestingly, this has the mark of the royal uh, China dealers, Thomas Good, um, here. They, they, uh, they specialised in the sale of uh, weems uh, from, nine, you know, even before 1900. Uh, and um, so that's almost a guarantee that it is a, a great piece of weems. I like it very much. Uh, they are getting highly collectible, especially a good piece of early weaves like this. I suppose uh, one's got to think in terms of perhaps £1,500 for it. This is the oval brass watch, the oh, yes, yes. earliest watch that you have. The one, yes. one of the earliest watches one's likely to find. Uh, it's had a very hard life, I'm afraid. The movement's been changed and... Uh, some bits are missing from the side of the case, but you can see from the dial and the engraving of the dial surround and the shape, the oval shape, that it was the first period. They were actually sometimes called as um, Nuremberg eggs. Yes. This would be an exceptionally valuable watch if it was still in perfect condition, yes. Yes. many thousands of pounds, but it's now something more really of a museum piece and uh, in view of the, the condition. And the next one here, this is made in uh, Switzerland in about oh, 1900 or so, and they were made as something of a, of a gimmick, but they were quite popular. And in fact, you can see right through the dial, it appears that there's no yeah. dial at all, yeah. but it has the hands. And it actually works, if one opens the back up, there's a small compartment for the movement. And you can actually see that the movement's tucked away in the top. Yes, and in the dark part, yeah. Put uh -huh. some ring of teeth around the edge of the glass in the middle, which turned the hands. It's a clever idea. Unfortunately, one of the glasses is cracked, but uh, Great, yes. it Thanks could be so. replaced. I remember that, yeah. Yeah. These, you used to find these very easily. Um, now they're worth about 750 pounds. Uh -huh. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, they were in a portfolio inherited by my grandfather in Northumberland. Yes. Was he something to do with the China trade? Or? No, he was, he was a lawyer. Right. And this was a, an artist friend, I presume. Yes. Well, I must say, they're two particularly charming watercolours. And the first one, as we can see here, uh, is entitled Habitation of a Mandarin. And there's a rather nice inscription underneath. And this is particularly nice because I'm th sure it's in the artist's handwriting, so it would be contemporary see, with, the, yes, with the watercolour. Yes. Mm. The other one is... I would have thought is probably a pleasure boat of some rich, maybe Mandarin trader, uh, and is obviously not a, a working boat because it has lovely decoration. You can see the dragons oh, yes, here, yes, yes, and the lovely painted panels. But coming back to this one here, uh, many of these sort of watercolours painted around 1840, that sort of thing, yeah. uh, are views on the Pearl River in China. And uh, I think that's most likely where this is. Have you ever thought of an artist for it at all? Or have you ever been told who it might well, be by? I was out in Hong Kong and I went to uh, Macau. Yes. Where Chinnery lived and yes. painted. Yes. And we've always wondered if Perhaps they they're by Chinnery, yes. Well, I think that's a very good name. I mean, Chinnery was a very influential artist. Yes. And uh, he did go out there, you're quite correct. Yes. Uh, and, and these are very similar to George Chinnery. And, uh, stylistically and the colouring and the drawing but I I feel they're not quite his hand yeah. and in fact we have a bit of a clue here because there appears to be a, a monogram uh, which is slightly illegible but looks to be HC 
Well, I must be honest, I'm not familiar with this name, H.C. Mm. Um, but the thing is, there were so many artists who went out to China, especially uh, from 1839 to 1842, when the first Opium War took yes, place. Yes. And a lot of naval and military people went out there. And in I fact, see, yes. uh, a lot of the naval people uh, were officially trained at Dartmouth to draw. It was one of the things, part of their training. And this, the reason for this was in order to record fortifications, because of course in those days they didn't have sophisticated cameras. And that's why in idle moments, when they had nothing better to do, they'd do these delightful little drawings and sketches. Have you ever thought in terms of valuation at all? Do you, do you have any idea what they might no, be worth? Not no, not at all. Obviously if you could find out who they're by, they'd be worth a little bit more, but let's be conservative. Mm -hmm. Let's say that this one here is probably worth somewhere in the region of eight to twelve hundred pounds. So I'd probably insure it for about twelve hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. And I think this one, probably a little bit less, is probably in the region of five to seven hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. yes, but I must yes. say I think they're particularly nice and, and uh, um, very interesting. I like them very much. Yes. Terribly pleased to know all that. In the late 1840s in France, there were three great glass houses that made paperweights. Oh. And they were called Baccarat, Saint Louis, and Clichy. Mm -hmm. And two of them, certainly, Baccarat and Saint Louis, made what, this kind of weight, which is called a mushroom weight, because you see you've got a sort of mushroom oh, shaped yes. uh -huh. basket of what are called canes in the middle. Now, most of the ones that have blue bands like this are uh, Baccarat, but I have a doubt in my mind here because when you look at this one, there's a tremendous amount of sort of salmony orange, isn't there? Which you don't normally find at Baccarat, and I, I think that this may well be a St. Louis one. It has a little problem there, that's a, called a bruise yeah. there. It was dropped about a year ago. Yeah, and that's a pity. Yeah. Uh, commercially, it might affect it for a, a few pounds, mm -hmm. but what would you think something like that could be worth? I have no idea. Well, I think that we are actually talking of something between 600 and 1,000 pounds. <gasps> I didn't think it would be that much. Yeah. You'd never believe that an object as tall and as complex as this would actually be used to hold a watch, which is in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, where on earth did it come from? Edinburgh. And under what circumstances? I mean, did you fall across it or...? No. I saw it on me all the and I went back to buy it. Right a week later. <laughs> Why didn't you buy it at the time? Because I didn't rate it. <laughs> it was too dear. Well, she's wonderful, isn't she? Um, yeah. Perhaps the best thing to do is to start with the watch itself, because that's, yeah. that's the, the essence of the whole piece. And this is a paired verge um, yeah. watch, and a, a normal verge watch like this would be worth perhaps uh, 150 pounds yeah. but this is fantastic with a picture of Wellington on it yeah um, and that's what this wonderful edifice is it's basically a, a watch stand but if we look at what it's made of first of all at the top the lady is made of ivory yeah now that may be marine ivory rather than elephant ivory yeah. coming down she's standing on this wonderful sort of altar if you like made of bone Further down still, you've got, this looks as though it could even be the cedar wood. I'm not sure about the, the wood that's um, making the, the main frame. And then at the bottom here, again, more bone uh, carving. And I'm looking at this and I'm wondering whether it's prisoner of war work, is it scrimshaw work? I'm going to really stick my neck out here and say that it, it could be um, scrimshaw work because there you'd have the absolute mix between um, whale ivory yeah. in the teeth and whale bone, which yeah. we've got a lot of here. The wood could have been found on board ship. Yeah. Have you had any thoughts on it yourself? No, I thought you were a prisoner of war work, that's all. The only thing I would say about prisoner of war work is that you don't tend to see that sort of um, use of, of ivory and in such large chunks, if you yeah. like. You'd have ivory in, in small pieces, but that's quite a, a, a decent chunk of ivory that she's yeah. been carved from. I'm, I'm sure somebody somewhere is gonna say, well, I think that it's yeah. prisoner of war work, somebody else is gonna think it's scrimshaw. Yeah. I'm torn between the two, I really am. Yeah. I can't say positively. What I can say is that the watch itself is dating from about 1825. Yeah. 
um, that would then date date the piece to yeah. sometime around or perhaps just after that, assuming yeah. that the watch had always yeah. been Lead with it, it yeah. which I don't think is unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to ask you what you paid for it. How long uh -huh. ago was it? 20 years since. I paid okay. too much for it. Well, how much? 200 quid. 200 quid 20 years ago. Well, I can see yeah. why it wasn't a snap decision. Yeah. Um, I would have said that we're talking about something in excess of 3,000 now. You're joking. You've got to be. Well, uh, my father-in-law bought the house we have about in the early 50s, and the previous family removed all their paintings, and uh, he needed something for the wall of the dining room, and he had a friend who was an auctioneer in Aberdeen, and I'm not really sure whether the friend gifted him this picture or whether he bought it. So it doesn't go very far back. I mean, actually, it's no. not, a, it's not a, a terribly old picture. It's painted after the turn of the century. Uh, in fact, uh, the most interesting th thing about this picture is not the artist, in fact, but it, what it does, it reflects the taste of uh, the period just after the turn of the century, say from 1910 to 20, yes. where there was an enormous interest and love of old master paintings. And this face, if you like, reflects uh, that period of art. The artist himself uh, is an Edinburgh artist and is best known not for this sort of painting, but for sort of rather um, beautiful mythological illustrations. It's a nice quality painting, and I think probably we should value it for insurance, say, at 8,000 pounds. My goodness, that is a great surprise. <laughs> what I'd like to know straight away is how a piece from India or China comes to be in Orkney. Well, all I know about the piece of furniture really is that it originally came from the castle of May. So that suggests that there have been perhaps some colonial interests uh, behind the, the provenance of this I piece. I believe so, yes. yes. Uh -huh. What I think is most spectacular about this piece of furniture, apart from its weight, which we can't demonstrate, is an extremely heavy piece yes, made uh -huh. out of East Indian rosewood is this extraordinary rippling effect across the facade here. Uh -huh. And this really shows some European influence. The whole form of the piece is something like an English slant front bureau. But this ripple effect across the front shows a distinctly Dutch influence. And uh -huh. the Dutch and the British, of course, traded in the Far East. Uh -huh. And many of the pieces that were made in the Far East took up certain aspects of European design. There's an interesting configuration of drawers. Uh, you can see there's one long drawer above two short drawers, and then uh -huh. two long drawers again, which is not a very European feature. I see. The, uh -huh. the handles, I think, are very nice here. You have this quite heavy swan neck handle with the pierced back place plates and a scutcheon here. But these uh -huh. are quite thin. Uh -huh. But that is fairly characteristic of uh, pieces that were imported from the Far East. And if we can, uh -huh. oh, wonderfully heavy. If you could perhaps pull out your, that's right. And inside, you get the full beauty of the, the unfaded color of this East Indian rosewood. If we move through, we can see that it has this European arrangement of pigeonholes got a document drawer here. It's had the hinges replaced at some point. Yes, it doesn't uh -huh. matter too much. I think the weight of this forefront has necessitated the replacing of the uh -huh. hinges. And then you can see that the ripple effect of the front is repeated in these lovely, again, rosewood drawers. So this is really a piece, I think, of uh, extraordinary quality. Do you have it separately insured? No, we don't actually know. Not well, that I know of. I think it might be worthwhile because something of this sort might well fetch between six, eight thousand pounds in uh, an auction. Good grief. <laughs> I think because we're surrounded with water, I was expecting to see quite a lot of um, instruments up here. But when you brought this in and it was a German chronometer, I thought to myself, well, it's slightly old. But then I realized that the fleet actually scuttled itself here in 1919. Did this come from down through your family? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I will lay a bet that this came off one of the, the ships because it's just the sort of instrument they'd have had. 
Now, it's a marine chronometer. Uh, it's actually made by a Kittel of Altona, and Altona was the centre in Germany where they tested a lot of chronometers. And we've got, actually, in the lid here, we have a label for Tietz of Kiel. He would have been the chandler or the supplier and regulator of the piece to the German Navy. There's something particularly interesting about this instrument. Well, let's have a look inside, because it's actually got... There we are. They're a real puzzle to get out of the box. OK. Now, if we look at the balance wheel here, you can actually see that it's like two balance wheels. The first one is the standard rim, and then you've got these little tiny miniature balance wheels on both sides of the balance itself. And they are for what is called middle temperature compensation. They correct for small differences in temperature change in the middle of the temperature range. The extremes will be taken care of by the, the large balance expanding and contracting, and the small ones will take care of minor differences. And it is an extremely rare feature. And the other interesting point about this instrument is that it has a pivoted detent escapement. Now, chronometer escapement or detent escapement is the type of escapement that was used for all marine instruments. And this one has a pivoted escapement, which is most unlike German work of this time. As a unique instrument and with a history of coming quite surely off the fleet, one of the fleet ships here before they scuttled, I would think that we'd certainly be looking at something between five and ten thousand pounds. <laughs> I think it's quite, yeah. quite glad it didn't go down on the ship. Exactly, yeah. Well, at the end of last week's program, you may remember I was speculating on exactly what we might find here in Orkney and indeed how many people would turn up because obviously there's a limited population. Well, we've been more than satisfied on every conceivable count. Indeed, one man from Stromness was saying to me earlier he thought we'd seen roughly half the population of the islands here today. It certainly felt like it. And even our treasure trove has turned up during the day in various forms as well. This, for instance, a stoneware pot that was recovered from the wreck of the German battle cruiser Hindenburg, which was scuttled with the rest of the ships out in Scapa Flow in 1919. And we've seen so many of these, too, Orkney's chairs. And a lot of them are subtly different because they were made by individual crofters who all had their own ideas on how the design of the chair should be practically uh, put together. So, our warm thanks to the people of Orkney and indeed those who joined us today from across the water on the north coast of Scotland. They're now on their way back to uh, Caithness. We're on our way now to Lancashire and I particularly hope you'll join us next week at the same time because that will be the last programme in the current series of the Antiques Red Show. So, until then, from all of us here in Orkney, goodbye.